Namaste. So if you have been following this channel for any length of time, you know that our position is that all forms of worship of God in any form are valid and lead to higher stages like meditation, Raj Yoga, and enlightenment. So even though, of course, we've argued this from many different points of view, there was never a direct scriptural support. But now I have found not only scriptural support, but the ultimate scriptural support in the Brahma Sutras. And the Brahma Sutra is also known as Vedanta Sutra, which means the end of knowledge, the highest Vedic knowledge, or the ultimate conclusions of the Vedas. So here it is. Anitya sarva same virodhya shabda numana byam. Anitya, non restriction. Sarva sam applies equally to all meditations. Avirodhya, there is no contradiction. Shabda anumana byam, as is known from Vedic and Smriti texts. The journey of the souls along the path of the gods is not restricted to any particular meditation. It applies to all meditations on qualified Brahman. This involves no contradiction as it is directly known from Upanishadic and Smriti texts and inference. Brahma Sutra 3331. So, by the way, the words in parentheses in the translation are picked up from the context of the discussion and brought into this verse by implication. In other words, to explain the sutra, which is very concise and laconic and abbreviated, one has to bring in these elements of meaning from the context, because, where's my parrot? Context determines meaning. So, what is the meaning here? Vedanta, or Brahma Sutras, describes two paths of the soul after death. One is the path of the moon. That path, although it does give heavenly rewards to those who are qualified, leads again to rebirth. So it is part of the samsara, the round of births and deaths. But the other path is the path of the sun. That path leads beyond and ultimately to Brahmaloka, where the living entity attains full enlightenment and complete oneness with Brahman. This is the final liberation. And this is what we're trying to attain, to achieve by all of our sadhana and sacrifices and so on. So, religious worship is not restricted to any particular meditation. Now, in the Vedas, and especially in the Upanishads, so many forms of meditation are given. In fact, you could say that every single mantra of the Upanishads is an instruction for meditation. They are that particular and that unique. That That's why they're called mantras and not just shlokas, because one can chant them, contemplate them, meditate on them, and through them, attain enlightenment. So in the Upanishads, Brahman has been compared to so many things, 
the sun, light, space, transcendental sound vibration, um, and so on and so on. Many, many things. So what is going on here? is that the Upanishads are using the process of superimposition deliberately. When they say Brahman can be worshipped in the sun, of course Brahman is not the sun. The sun is simply a reflection of Brahman. Or when they say Brahman is consciousness, Consciousness is simply a reflection of Brahman in the living entity. So there you are using superimposition. They're superimposing something on Brahman or superimposing Brahman on something else. And then, through later discussion, they will remove the superimposition. And then you have Brahman as it is. So this is the method of the Upanishads. Considering this, then, all the various deities, the different sacrifices, the meditations, and so on, even the arguments, the debates in the scriptures on what is the correct philosophy and so on, are all of the same nature. They are simply temporary superimpositions on Brahman that, when the superimposition is removed, lead to the realization of Brahman as it is. Therefore, there is no restriction to any particular meditation it applies to all meditations on qualified Brahman. Qualified Brahman means the secondary Brahman, Maya or Shakti, whereas the primary Brahman, Shiva, actually has no qualities. The secondary Brahman or qualified Brahman has all qualities, and she is of the nature of illusion, of the material creation. Nevertheless, she is also divine, transcendental, beginningless, and inexplicable. This is Maya. So the process of religion leading to meditation and self-realization involves meditation on certain deities, or qualities of Brahman. And these are necessarily superimposed on Brahman because Brahman as it is has no qualities. That's all right, because the aim is when the meditation becomes stable, the superimposition is removed and Brahman reveals itself. This is stated in many places, that when the self is satisfied by worship, it reveals itself by itself. Because the self is knowledge, the self is consciousness, the self is realization of reality. That's its nature. So when the self is pleased with the individual, the conditioned soul, it reveals itself. And the, the poet Rumi has made a nice verse about this, that when the drop merges into the ocean, the ocean merges into the drop. This is a very wonderful verse. This is another thing <laughs> you can meditate on, and it will lead to realization. So finally, how do we know this? What is the confirmation of it? Well, by reading the Upanishads and the Smritis, like the Puranas and so on, one can understand that there are so many forms of God, so many incarnations, 
so many different expressions of the individuality of Brahman. One can worship any of them according to one's preference. That's why in one Purana it is said you have to worship Vishnu. Vishnu is the highest. And in another Purana it is said you have to worship Shiva. Shiva is the highest. And in yet another you have to worship Shakti. Shakti is the highest. <laughs> this produces confusion in small minds. But the more intelligent, the larger minds, take a step back and look at this and, and say, wait a minute. All these scriptures are saying basically the same thing about different deities. So how is it that they are not contradicting one another? How is it, how can we understand that the Vedas and Upanishads are one and give the same message in all cases? Well, it's just like the descriptions of the creation. In the Vedas and Upanishads, even in the Puranas, there are so many descriptions of the creation and none of them are alike. <laughs> none of them are the same. What is the message here? The creation doesn't really matter. It's like any way you want to look at it. It's fine. The important thing is that you have an ontology, a series of meanings and classifications into which you can analyze creation. Why? So that you don't become identified with it. You can see that each one, each different category of manifestation is only partial. So in the same way, why have so many gods? Why have so many different processes of religion and meditation and sacrifice, etc., etc.? so that when we view it from a perspective, we can see with detachment that, oh, these are all only partial. These are all only different classifications of the qualities of Brahman into an ontological system that, in summary, describes the whole. And the whole is Brahma, the reality, that which all religions aim at, the object of all forms of worship and meditation and contemplation and philosophy. We've often made the argument that all religions, philosophies, science, politics, economics, even warfare— is aimed at the reduction or elimination of suffering, at least for somebody. <laughs> Nevertheless, because these methods are all only partial, they have not succeeded in thousands of years of human history in eliminating suffering. The only method that has succeeded is self-realization. And that is because we want to think that we're the doer. And because we're the doer, or we identify ourselves as the doer, our efforts are all partial, illusory, and ineffective. But when we focus on Brahman and pray to Brahman for illumination and pray to Brahman to reveal itself, it does. And this is the great secret of complete enlightenment and the elimination of all suffering. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.